Hello, Sky and Massimo. Hi, Bob. Hi, Bob. Nice to be here. Good to have you. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on both streaming video and via audio podcast. You are, respectively, uh, Sky Cleary and Massimo Pugliucci. And by the way, as I speak your names, I think I'm going to activate the uh, feature of this that magically highlights the person who is speaking. Oh, uh, nice. I, I like magic. Yeah. We don't normally do this because normally it's just two people, but uh, I think we would be a little on the small side if we tried to cram all three of us in. So, Sky, yes. um, you have never been on uh, Meaning of Life TV. Before. Well, you've been on Meaning of Life TV, but not with me. Is that true? That's true. Yes, we were with our uh, co-editor, Dan Kaufman, um, and when he was uh, moderating a discussion between Massimo and I about stoicism and existentialism. That was a masterful segue to book promotion, Sky. I want to <laughs> I want to uh, compliment you for working the word co-editor <laughs> in there, because that leaves me no choice but to talk about your book, which is what we're going to talk about. Uh, it's called How, How to Live a Good Life, A Guide to Choosing Your Personal Philosophy, as you suggest, it has co-editors. One of them is uh, Massimo, who is here. Another is Dan Kaufman, who uh, may be familiar to some of our uh, viewers and listeners as host of the Sophia podcast, which is also on meaningoflife.tv. Uh, so why don't you two say a little bit more about yourselves? Your uh, plot spoiler, you're both philosophers, as is Dan. But beyond that, why don't you, uh, Sky, why don't you start and give us a little sense of yourself? Sure. So I teach at Barnard College and uh, Columbia part time. Um, and I'm also the um, editor in chief of the American Philosophical Association's blog. Um, and my first book was on um, was called Existentialism and Romantic Love that came out in 2015. Um, so this is my How to Live a Good Life is my second book. And I am working on a third book about Simone de Beauvoir and how her philosophy is relevant to today. Okay. And she is, of course, a uh, famous existentialist, was. That's right. Yep. So, in fact, um, the chapter that I wrote for How to Live a Good Life was kind of what sparked me to kind of, um, explore that realm uh, further. Yeah. And we will definitely be talking about existentialism. But before okay. we do that, let's turn to Massimo, uh, who has been on with me before talking about his, is it unfair to call it a hobby horse, Massimo? <laughs> no, go ahead. Stoicism. Uh, I guess we should say high minded and call it your personal philosophy. <laughs> yeah, one way or the other. It doesn't okay. matter. Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a professor of philosophy at the City College of New York, and um, my background is mixed. I started my academic career as a biologist interested in gene environment interactions or what normally are referred to as nature nurture things. And then after my midlife crisis, I switched fields, went back to school, got my degree, and now I am in philosophy of science. Um, but yes, in the last several years, stoicism somehow has sort of taken over my life. And it's these days, it truly really is most of what I do, in fact. So, okay. Um, let's say a little bit about the book before we get back to you two and your relationships um, to the book. Uh, it you know, it has uh, it has chapters on various uh, philosophical traditions and I should say religious traditions. Some of the major religious traditions uh, are are they all written by proponents of the philosophies as a, 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 and the traditions as opposed to mere analysts of them? Yeah, that was part of the idea. Um, that we wanted, we didn't want an academic book of you know people explaining the theory. <laughs> of whatever, be they that Buddhism, you know, existential and, and so on. Uh, we wanted people who actually are practicing or living by or tr attempt to live by those philosophies and religions. And so we wanted, yes, of course, there is a part about the theory. I mean, you have to know something about what these things, uh, what these traditions say. Uh, but we wanted somebody who actually, um, a, a set of authors who actually were trying to live by them and tell us about their stories and how that fit in their life. Okay. Yeah, and this came from, actually, the idea came from the conversation we had with Dan on um, The Meaning of Life TV because Massimo, Massimo and I were talking about how philosophy had radically changed our lives. And um, so we thought, hey, let's 
talk to other people who are trying to live their chosen philosophies and, you know, ask them how it helped them to lead better lives. That's great. So Meaning of Life TV will be getting a, a piece of the royalties then, it sounds like. <laughs> no. yeah, it's a very, it's going to be a very small part. <laughs> did, we, did we forget to get you to sign the contract? Apparently. Apparently. <laughs> Um, so some of the traditions you look at, uh, I'll just quickly uh, recap the table of contents. Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism under the ancient philosophies from the East heading. Um, under ancient philosophies from the West, Aristotelianism, Stoicism, Epicureanism. Uh, I just had, by the way, Catherine Wilson on who's written um, yep. How to Be an Epicurean. Uh, in some ways analogous to your How to Be a Stoic uh, Master. Yeah, same publisher too. Oh, really? Basic books. <laughs> yeah, for both basic of books. Yeah, That's great. Yeah. Um, then religious traditions, Hinduism, G- uh, Judaism, Christianity, progressive Islam, ethical culture, uh, and modern philosophies, existentialism, pragmatism, effective altruism, secular humanism. If we have time, I'll, I'll ask you a question about the, the religious, um, thing, uh, the religious section, but we're probably going to stick mainly with philosophies. So for starters, um, do you, so you said, the, the, you know, the authors are ad, advocates of, of the traditions, proponents of them. Um, is it fair to say in your two cases that you're almost evangelists in the, in the sense that, <laughs> that, that uh, in other words, it isn't just that after a kind of objective uh, perusal of the various philosophical traditions, you think one has stronger intellectual foundations than the other. It's more like in your two cases, at least these philosophies actually had a dramatic, impact on your life. I, I definitely get that from your um, chapter, Sky. Uh, and, and is it fair to say for you too, Massimo? Uh, to some extent. I mean, th- those two possibilities you just outlined, I don't think uh, they're actually mutually exclusive. Um, because in my case, I actually did do pretty much what you just described. I did go out and sort of shop for it, for a, a new philosophy of life over a period of, of a few years. I did not do a, such a comprehensive job as it's done in the, in the book. And of course, even the book only takes a look at 15 traditions. There's probably, you know, dozens more that, that we could have included. Um, but I did do something like that. I mean, I grew up Catholic. I, I realized for a number of, of reasons that that was, you know, Christianity in general wasn't, wasn't going to do it for me or in fact, any religion that had that used some kind of transcendental element of a godlike type, so that excluded a bunch of things. But when I started looking more actively, I actually did explore seriously secular humanism. I took a look, a look at Buddhism, and I took a look at two other uh, eudaimonic philosophies, Aristotelianism and Epicureanism. So even though it was not a comprehensive search, uh, I did search, and, and Stoicism is the one that struck me as the best fit for me, for my personality. I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily argue that this is good for, for everybody or that this is the best way to, to go about these sort of things. But so I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. Of course, once you start practicing a particular philosophy, then you actually become also invested, you know, personally mm-hmm. in it, which is part of the thing that we wanted. We wanted to uh, get readers to get these, these feeling that philosophy is not an abstract, only at least an abstract pursuit of you know, intellectual truths or something like that. It's it's something you can live on a day to day basis. Okay. Yeah, and I don't know if I would call myself an evangelist. Um and, and certainly not I wouldn't call myself an existentialist in the same way that Massimo might call himself a stoic. Because existentialist But to be fair, no existentialist ever did did, did they? <laughs> well they kind of reluctantly <laughs> agreed to it. <laughs> <laughs> and I think there was one or two that did, but, uh, no. yeah, but I think the issue with existentialism is that it's, it's very ambiguous and, you know, that you don't have specific practices like, uh, cold showers or fasting. Um, no. and. <laughs> no, existentialists aren't famous for cold showers, I have to say, <laughs> when I, when I think of, uh, Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir, no. Exactly. Yeah. And Coffee, this, I mean, this, cigarettes, wine, you know, <laughs> like that. That. those are the practices. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, and you know, there's no st- specific doctrine. It's more like a, a bunch of overlapping themes. Um, but at, at the same time, it is a living philosophy. And, you know, what I wanted to show in my chapter was that um, sometimes I think about my life and my choices in an existential way. Okay. So uh, I, I thought we would spend some time uh exploring both of your your uh, contributions in particular 
Um, I mean, there's a lot to talk about in the book. We will, we will touch on some other questions, but it's, it's a good opportunity to, uh, to dig deeply into the traditions you represent. And, and Sky, in your case, that's, uh, especially welcome for me personally, because honestly, I've never had a super clear idea of what existentialism is. You, these phrases pop up, existential dread, um, you know, you think of absurdity in some sense. Uh, but I don't, I have to say, uh, I'm hoping to learn a lot uh, from you. Well, I learned a lot from your chapter, but, but I'm hoping, hoping that our audience will learn more here and, and that I will as well. Um, what do you, uh, before we talk about how existentialism entered your life, which I think we should do, what is your answer when people ask you, what is existentialism? Well, my answer is, first of all, it's complicated. Um, but there, like I said, there are a few key things. Um, and I mean, one of the key ones is that uh, existence precedes essence. So although we didn't choose to be born, um, we can't choose the situations into which we're thrown. Um, and, you know, the world is uh, absurd and there's no ready-made meaning. I mean, so sometimes we inherit philosophies from our parents, which is something we talk about in the book. But um, for existentialists, the the key point is to is that it's up to each individual to to figure out how to live, and one of the key um, uh, I guess that sort of the key theme is freedom. Uh, so we're free to choose our actions, um, but with freedom comes a heavy burden for our responsibilities, and that can be very anxiety inducing. And the goal so, of life so, is so that's that's the existential dread part when you realize that you are actually free and therefore in some sense accountable or responsible for what happens next. Exactly. So there's no, most of the existential philosophers were atheists. So, you know, once, um, if you accept that, then there's no one to forgive your sins, um, once you get to heaven or wherever it is. Um, and so, uh, the goal is to try and live your life as authentically as possible. Okay. Um, so when you say existence precedes essence, existence is just kind of the fact of your plight. It's like you're here, deal with it. That's the existence part. And then the essence part is like, is that kind of what you choose to make of it? The the, the essence you choose to create, the essence of you as a person or what? Exactly. Yeah. And the, um, the existential forces talked about it in terms of facticity and transcendence. So there are facts of our lives that uh, we can't change. You know, we live in certain um, social political systems, um, you know, in certain bodies. Um, but what we need to try and focus on is what we can do to you know, move, move beyond our facticity. So, um, yeah, they call that transcendence. So mm-hmm. if we strive towards self-chosen goals. Okay. Now, right there, I sense an intersection of sorts with stoicism, uh, just just in the sense of, you know, yeah. there are these facts. Y- y- there are some facts you're not going to change. Uh, certainly the fact, well, the fact that you exist, I don't recommend changing, and most people choose not to change <laughs> that. Um, uh, but, but there are other facts as well. Uh, stoicism, as well, really emphasizes the, 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 the grim reality. <laughs> reality of of the fact or at least the stubbornness of of some facts and correct and- yeah yeah i mean that is one of the you're absolutely correct that that is one of the areas where stoicism and existentialism actually uh have um quite a bit in common i mean the stoics uh start out with a principle called the dichotomy of control and uh, that is the notion that some things are outside of our control and other things are uh under our control so we some things are up to us as epictetus one of the uh, leading Stoics, ancient Stoics says, and other things are not up to us. So then, then wisdom essentially consists in realizing and internalizing, uh, this, this distinction and then focusing your efforts on the things that actually are under your control, the things that you can actually do, uh, and then developing a attitude of equanimity toward the rest. Stuff happens and, uh, you know, Sometimes the, the the universe will turn your way. Sometimes it, it won't turn your way. Uh, this is a search a fact of life. And part of being an adult, responsible person is that you are prepared to accept that despite all your best efforts, uh, sometimes you're gonna you're gonna fail. That doesn't mean um, that you are morally culpable uh, for that failure, unless in fact you did make errors of judgments, unless you did act badly. And but those things, those errors, and those actions are under your control. 
So both stress agency, is that fair to say? Yes. And um, I, I guess one difference between the two, between um, uh, stoicism and existentialism would be the extent to which we un- live in a universe with inherent meaning. I mean, I take the, the Stoics to be uh, kind of moral realists, right? I mean, they, they, they think there is moral truth out there. It's, it's in a sense embodied in the universe, right? And, 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 and their, their philosophy is founded on that. Whereas existentialists uh, start from what might ostensibly seem a grimmer starting yeah. point. Yeah, that's an interesting point because that is actually a point of contention among modern Stoics. So the ancient Stoics certainly believed in a providential universe. Uh-huh. Um, uh, so there, there is reasons why things happen. Now, when I say providential universe, don't think sort of, sort of the Christian God who has ordered things uh, for the best and all that sort of stuff. Uh, well, they, they, they were pantheists. They thought that God was the same thing as nature. And in fact, they saw nature as a gigantic living organism. And so imagine that the, that the cosmos is a living organism and we are just cells, you know, in, that are bits of, and pieces of this organism. Mm-hmm. So in a sense, whatever we do as, as cellular components of this gigantic organism has a meaning because it helps the organism function mm-hmm. in whatever way it, it needs to function. Uh, that doesn't mean that things are going to go well for us. Or that doesn't mean that the, 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 the uh, organism actually cares about individual cells. But there is a sense of comfort in the fact that, you know, whatever happens to me, even bad stuff, uh, it's actually helping the, the, the universe at large. Epictetus has this wonderful metaphor of, you know, imagine you're a foot uh, that is an organ of the, of the body, and the foot has to cross a muddy uh, path because the organ, the, the, the body has to get home. Now, the foot isn't going to like it to have to step into the mud, but, you know, he is the foot. And, mm-hmm. and so once he realizes that his member, you know, it's a part of this gi- gigantic organ, is then he will do it gladly because, hey, that's the only thing we all get home, not just, not just me. Modern Stoics uh, uh, have disagreements about this. Some, uh, a small component, small number of modern Stoics uh, maintain the original position, a pantheistic position. Um, but the majority um, of modern Stoics are either agnostic or atheists, uh, and so they actually lean toward a metaphysics that's much closer to what Sky was, was uh, describing. Mm-hmm. Um, now, in that case, you lose the sense of providence. And so as modern Stoic uh, uh, Lawrence Baker uh, put it in a book called A New Stoicism, he says, you know, the, the uh, dichotomy of control basically reduces to follow the facts, the facts of science. The universe is whatever science tells us it is or the best approximation that we have. And uh, the, the Stoic attitude is, um, well, that's a part of what the existentialists will call facticity. And now it's still up to me, however, how to deal with that. It's mm-hmm. still up to me, as Kai said, to transcend that fact is it not in any uh, sort of metaphysically heavy sense, not in the sense that we can somehow, uh, you know, arise above the laws of physics, but in the sense that we are part and parcel of the universal web of cause and effect. Uh, we Things don't just happen to us. We are part of the way things happen. And, uh, and therefore, our responsibility lies in that little bit of the uh, universal uh, web of cause and effect that goes through us. Okay. So and I'll also say, can I, yeah, yeah. just put, add in that, um, Simone de Beauvoir describes it, um, actually that I think she, um, took also from us. The Stoic philosophy is that we're like stones in an arch that no pillars support. So we're kind of in this together. We're in webs of relationships, but we're kind of left adrift in the universe. Um, and the response to that is going to be different depending on which existential philosophy you're talking about. And also, you know, which stage <laughs> that existential philosopher was at. Um, for example, Jean-Paul Sartre was much more focused on radical freedom. And um, he said, well, if you come across, you know, a craggy mountain that you know, you just can't traverse, then we'll change your course and go a different way. Um, whereas Simone de Beauvoir would say, which she was much more attuned to the limitations on our freedom, um, especially that she got into in the second sex and saying, you know, it's, it's not okay that some, that there are some mountains in front of some people. And so we need to kind of, um, bond together and, um, change the structures in which we live to, to be able to live a better life. Okay. Uh, but I do, I, I, so I gather in existentialism, one thing there is a fair amount of agreement on, uh, kind of in contrast to stoicism, it sounds like, is, is this starting point 
of, of a universe with, in a certain sense, intrinsic meaningless, or at least no intrinsic meaning? Is, is that putting it too strongly? Uh, uh, maybe, maybe a way to ask the question is to ask you to elaborate on something you say in the book, which is that you, you characterize Frederick Nietzsche as the, like, intellectual grandfather or something of, of, um, existentialism. I took that to mean that, uh, you know, I, 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 I was thinking the, excuse me, the God is dead part of Nietzsche. Right. So yeah, Nietzsche said God is dead and we have killed him, <laughs> meaning that, um, you know, the structure of society used to be founded on religion, but then the enlightenment came along and, you know, we discovered that, um, we're not here because of Adam and Eve, but because of evolution. And so the problem that Nietzsche had was that we keep on living in society as if uh, on these false foundations, you know, as if there were still a God, um, that, you know, not everyone believes in anymore. Um, and then, you know, Camus kind of, um, elucidated that, you know, we, we are thrown into this world. I mean, a lot of the atheist existential philosophers said, and actually it was Heidegger's term to um, talk about being thrown. But, you know, we're here with no kind of guidebook for, for how to live. I mean, if you're religious, yes, you have um, certain texts, but even then it's you know, ambiguous. Um, and so, but if you're atheist, then, you know, they're really, they're, there's nothing and we're left adrift and, you know, it's really hard to understand what to do. And that's why part of the existential project, one of the fundamental parts of the existential Central project is, you know, figuring out for ourselves how to live, and it's not easy. Okay, that's uh, Bob. That's I think where where the one distinction with Stoicism is interesting. You, you characterized uh, Stoic philosophy a minute ago as a sort of uh, in morally realistic, and I suppose to some extent that's true, especially for the ancient Stoicism Stoics. But but I actually would ca- characterize it as quasi realism. Uh, there is somewhere between uh, between moral realism and and sort of moral constructivism. So those are, as you know, those are the two broad categories uh, when it comes to moral truths. You know, if you're a moral realist, then you think that moral truths are in a sense mind independent. They are out there. They are they are really analogous to at least mathematical truths, is not if not physical truths. And um, if you're a moral, a moral constructivist, you just say, no, morality is a human invention and we just make up stuff as it goes and uh, as we go and, and some things work better than others, uh, as it turns out, sort of empirically, experimental. The Stoics, especially modern Stoics, have a kind of an intermediate situation, which I find particularly palatable because they say that on the one hand, yes, human ethics is a construction of human beings. After all, the word ethics comes from the Greek ethikos, which just meant, you know, a way to get along together. The point of ethics is to learn how to get along with other people. Um, and that may mean different things depending on different contexts and who those people are and, and, and what they want. But at the same time, they also maintain, Stoics also maintain that there are some fairly serious constraints on what makes for a good ethics or not a good ethics. And those constraints are found in human nature. So, and by human nature, I don't mean any, any kind of impermanent, uh, you know, uh, I mean, sort of, sorry, permanent uh, essence that defines human beings. I just mean the facts of being a, a human animal, right? And those facts that ma- matter the most for the Stoics are we are uh, eminently social and we're capable of reason. For them, it follows, therefore, you take those two as sort of axioms of, of, of the human condition, and it follows that, therefore, a good human life consists in using that ability to reason in order to improve uh, society, to improve the world, to make things better for, for everybody. Okay. So why don't we um, delve a little into your personal stories in relationship to your personal philosophies? I mean, as I said... Uh, I, yeah, I think sometimes, um, when somebody's a proponent of a, of a philosophical tradition, it's because of the impact it had on their lives. Um, uh, Sky, do you want to talk about how you, um, I mean, both of you actually, um, neither of you started out as a philosopher. Um, you both had, uh, kind of career changes that, uh, that are, are related to your interest in philosophy. Sky, do you want to, you want to talk about how you, where, where you were in your life, uh, when you happened upon existentialism and decided to move into philosophy as a career? Sure. Uh, so yeah, my background is in financial markets. Um, so I worked there for, um, quite a few years and, um, then, 
uh, actually in New York, and then I moved back home and um, did an MBA. Uh, and there was, I, I guess, a collision of factors that were happening. I was in my late twenties, and I had, you know, pressure to get married. I had saw friends getting married. You know, I had kind of boyfriends channeling me into certain expectations. Um, and then, you know, pop culture had all these, um, you know, Disney rom coms about you know, meeting the one and um, falling in love, getting married and living happily ever after. Um, but at the same time, I saw that, um, you know, a lot of marriages around me were pretty unhappy and, you know, divorce was sort of rates are still kind of close to 50%. Um, and so I wasn't sure if that was a good idea. I'm like, why should we get married if it really doesn't work out? Um, so I had a lot of questions about um, how we should live and, you know, how c- can you choose to love was one of the big questions I was dealing with. And, and how should we love? And, you know, who should we love? And how do you know if they're the one? Is there even such a thing as the one? Um, you know, you read magazines and it's like, oh, well, if he doesn't ogle other women and if he doesn't like spicy foods, <laughs> then you're, you're fine. I mean, these crazy things. Um, so I was in a, an MBA class and I went to, um, Macquarie university in Sydney, uh, where there are some philosophers on faculty. And in one of the classes, one of the instructors started talking about, um, uh, it was, I guess her PhD was about existentialism in the boardroom. And so she started talking about Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir and freedom and responsibility and anxiety and ambiguity. And that really spoke to me because they seem to be dealing with similar questions that I was asking. Um, now I know I didn't get any answers in that, in that lecture, but I think just having the narrative through which to think about uh, some of these issues I, I found really helpful and intriguing. Um, uh, sorry, but, go ahead. but it, it was existentialism per se, as much as philosophy more broadly, that kind of captured you at that point? Yeah. I mean, I had done some philosophy in my undergraduate degree, but it was very analytic and I, it just didn't, capture me at all. Um, and so there was no existentialism um, in in my undergraduate degree. Uh, so yeah, I was really, I guess, coming across like this new way of doing philosophy that I hadn't encountered before that I found really intriguing. And was it, was it partly a sense of kind of um, radical freedom? Uh, that you, In other words, it sounds like you were at a point in your life where you weren't sure you were on the right path. And I gather that um, kind of one of the take homes of existentialism is, you know, take the bull by the horns, uh, go crazy. Uh, maybe, maybe that's not a formal doctrine of uh, existentialism, <laughs> but, but uh, well, two things. A, am I, am I wrong in, uh, in, in, in the way I'm thinking of existentialism or the subtext of it or whatever? And B, what uh, can you, can you, can you, put a finer point on what exactly got you kind of excited about it. Yeah, I think I I found it very liberating that um, I think I started to become aware of these, I guess, pressures around me and also um, kind of the internal narratives that I'd been um, kind of, uh, well, these narratives that I'd internalized about what a good life should be and um, how we should live. Uh, And so, yeah, I think it was, the this idea of freedom that we um, we can choose to throw it all away and at the same around the same time um, there was a book that came out by um, Hazel Rowley called Tete a Tete you know the um, lives of Simone de Beauvoir and Jean Paul Sartre and I read that and I mean they were um, very radical for for their time I mean this was like the 1930s 1940s um, they didn't get married they uh, but they had an open relationship and it was a lifelong kind of romantic commitment and I really admired um, some of the ways that uh, they tried to, first of all tried to live their philosophy but also um, the way that they kind of eschewed like social expectations of, of what they were meant to do and uh, created, you know, a relationship on their own terms. Um, and, you know, there was a cost to that. Um, I mean, there always is a cost to um, uh, turning away from what society is pushing you into. But I, that's 
idea that I could do something different and that um, that there wasn't one size fits all answer was really, uh, I think that was really liberating for me. Okay. Um, so uh, to some extent, I gather it was almost um, the appeal of Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir as uh, kind of role models, right? I, I mean, it was, uh, there was something about the lifestyle that was intriguing and I, and I'm sure it's easy to get confused between their lifestyle and their philosophy, right? So can you talk a little about like what parts of their lifestyles and their stories um, do authentically represent the philosophy? Yeah, so I, I think they were specifically trying to create a philosophy to be lived. Um, I mean, they'd been through uh, college and kind of got bored with how abstract, you know, Hegel and all the others were. And so they, I mean, ex- the root of existential philosophy came from sitting down over an apricot cocktail and Raymond Aron said, oh, if you're a phenomenologist, you could make a philosophy out of this cocktail. And that kind of blew their minds. So this this idea that um, you could tie together life and philosophy on an intimate basis. Can you can you focus on that itself a little more, the phenomenology in the cocktail? First of all, what do we mean by I know what a cocktail is. What do we mean by phenomenology? So it's about looking really deeply at experiences and describing as accurately as possible um, the phenomenon of what's going on. And that's why, you know, existentialism certainly picks up on this idea of being kind of more descriptive than prescriptive, which goes back to what I said earlier, is there's not necessarily specific practices because it's all for us to to work it out for ourselves. Um, so I, I think that, um, yes, they tried to live their philosophy. And, and this is one of the reasons that they wrote uh, novels and published their diaries and published their letters, because it was them trying to trying to figure it out as they went along. And there were certainly some conflicts in there. I mean, I think one of the biggest conflicts was, um, so she and Sartre tried, Beauvoir and Sartre tried to um, create an open relationship and establish themselves as um, essential and they could have other relationships that were uh, contingent. But when, in fact, Beauvoir realized later on that, you know, that was a flaw in their system to assume that the contingent loves would, would just go along with it. And a lot of them were really hurt um, by their relationship. So I think that's a big area where, uh, you know, they found that their philosophy fell short. Okay. Um, so Massimo, um, at this point, why, why don't we, uh, why don't we ask you to do a little more in the way of, uh, comparing and contrasting, um, before we, I, I do want to get back into, uh, existentialism per se a little more, but, but first just, uh, by by kind of stereotype, you would think that Stoicism and existentialism are in some ways the opposite. We think of Stoics as very kind of disciplined people who preserve their equanimity while uh, all right. around them is flux and challenge and so on. Right. And again, by stereotype, uh, the existentialists, at least the ones we've been talking about, uh, are not n- known particularly for their their equanimity or their discipline. You know, they stay out all night and they drink and smoke and so on. Um, <laughs> is that a is, is that a, a valid apprehension of actual differences in your view between the two? There's something to that. I mean, the Archimedes Laertius uh, in his uh, Lives and Opinions of the Eminent Philosophers says uh, that Stoics drink wine, but they don't get drunk, for instance. Uh, so, you know, they're okay with pleasure. Pleasure is a selectable thing, is a preferred thing. Um, but so long as you control the pleasure, not the, not the other way around, right? And so long as it doesn't become sort of an all-consuming, you know, major part of, of, of your life. So to some extent, there are some, certainly there are behavioral differences. However, there are, the more this guy was talking, the more I was struck by actually the, the more fundamental uh, similarities. I mean, we already highlighted uh, uh, sort of the stoic version of the existentialist facticity and transcendence. You know, so, so you, there are facts about life that you can't change, and what is really up to you is, is how you deal with, with, with those facts. Those, those are ma- that's a major thing in common. The other thing that is in common, you, you, you interestingly asked uh, Sky to sort of separate the life 
of the philosophers, you know, of Sartre and de Beauvoir from their philosophy. This is a very modern, uh, that, that kind of question reflects a very modern attitude toward philosophy, which both, I think, the existentialists and certainly the Greek Romans uh, would, thought, would think it's misguided. Um, um, because, in fact, in, in the ancient, I mean, the reason why we have Diogenes Laertius' book on the lives of the philosophers, and not just the opinions, it's the lives and the opinions of the, of the philosophers, is because anybody who wouldn't live their philosophy would be considered a hypocrite. And, in fact, uh, you would learn as much, if not more, about people's philosophy by looking at the way they lived. And, you know, the quintessential case, of course, being Socrates. Uh, you, you study just as much what Socrates actually did uh, particularly if you read uh, Xenophon's version of, of uh, Socrates as opposed to Plato, which is more more analytical and more into the, the actual philosophy. And, and I like this notion that it doesn't make any sense to espouse a philosophy of life and then not live through it. I mean, we all live it in a more or less you know, perfect way, we're all failures, we're all, we're all, you know, nobody's a sage and that sort of stuff, fine. But if you keep talking about something and then you don't do it, that seems to, you know, that strikes me as, as hypocritical. And it turns out that um, this this difference in attitude uh, between, you know, the, the, the classical stance of if you, if you espouse a philosophy, you better leave it, and the modern one is like, no, it's all about analytics, is... In my, in my mind is best exemplified by a series of studies that have come up over, over the last few years about the behaviors of moral philosophers, meaning professional philosophers who actually specialize in ethics, you know, and moral philosophy. Turns out that by a number of different measures, moral philosophers are no more moral or ethical, uh, are, are than they as bad your, as economists? Aren't, aren't economists famously bad people according to some study? That's a good question. I think that the, the comparison was the average academic at, at their own campus. And so they're no better uh, than, they're no worse either, but they're no better than the, than the average academic. And many people, rightly, I think, were surprised by this because they said, well, what is the point of studying ethics uh, if you're not better at living your life? I mean, that would be like a statistician who nevertheless, uh, you know, so you understand probability theory and nevertheless banks his retirement on, on playing the lottery. That, that, that makes no sense. That means that the guy either doesn't understand the stuff that he's teaching or he just doesn't care, which would be really bizarre. Um, and yet this is not surprising because the modern, modern philosophy, just like any other modern academic discipline is in fact a highly analytical, highly specialized uh, you know, technical uh, piece of work so that you can spend your entire life commenting on Kant uh, without really being a deontologist, without really following Kant's philosophy. You can spend, you know, you can write dozens of papers on John Stuart Mill without actually being a utilitarian uh, in, in your life. That, to the ancient Greek Romans, and I assume to the existentialists, from what Sky would say, makes no sense. If you, if you buy into a philosophy, if you think this is a good way of living your life, then you better try to live your life accordingly. As, as I said, you know, with, with all the limitations that actual lives, uh, uh, you know, imply. Sky, would you say that's fair that existentialists in particular would expect some kind of alignment, uh, between, uh, accepting the logic of existentialism, I guess, and, and living it. I mean, I would think that in principle, if you accepted the logic of any philosophy, you, 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 you would, but, you would be expected to align your life with it, but maybe, maybe not. In any event, Sky, does that, how does that look from an existential point of view? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I think that's what, what the existential philosophers were trying to do. Um, and I mean, Kierkegaard, who's often considered the father of existentialism. Um, Not to be confused with the grandfather, who as we, I've never thought of Kierkegaard <laughs> well, as Nietzsche's son before, but whatever. Uh, if, if Nietzsche is the grandfather and Kierkegaard is the father, I guess that's where we are. Go ahead, yeah. sorry. Um, so of course he was religious, um, but you know, he, one of his um, gripes was that the problem with um, people's relationship with God at the time was that it was so abstract and the um, you know, the priests were the ones who were sort of intermediating the relationship. And so one of Kierkegaard's key things was to develop a personal relationship with God. And that was what a lot of his philosophy was re- revolved around, that personal like understanding and, and thinking about frameworks for him personally. And I think all the existentialists that, well, pretty much all the existentialists that I can think of that came after that were were of the same view. Yeah, that's that's interesting because I had 
previously suggested that, you know, existentialism starts uh, from the assumption that there's no inherent meaning and we have to build whatever meaning there is. But Kierkegaard, as a Christian, wouldn't have, I guess, wouldn't have bought into that exactly. I mean, why was he thrown in? Because he wasn't, uh, he doesn't, he's, he predates uh, by a little bit the classic existentialists. He probably didn't call himself an existentialist. What, so what, can you say a little more about why everyone else is calling him one? Yeah, so, um, I mean, he he was brought up religious, and um, he, um, I guess what he actually came to the conclusion was, what, yeah, there is, he, he went through the similar process to the, that the later existentialists came to, was like, well, how do we find meaning in a world, and is God valid? Uh-huh. Um, and I guess he came to the conclusion that, um, well, you know, Christianity promises, you know, eternal happiness in the afterlife. Like, why wouldn't you want that? So it's almost, I, I see him as saying, well, you know, there is no inherent meaning in life and therefore we've got to make one up. And that, and I think Christianity is a really good one to leap to. Um, uh, okay. So he, he, he's, he's almost asserting Christianity as much as accepting it. Uh, he, he, He's yeah. not just accepting it on faith. It sounds like he, it's a choice. It's a choice. Being a Christian is a is a is a choice. Yeah, absolutely. And he, he was saying, you know, it's a choice that you need to reiterate with every step. But then, you know, you need to make a kind of a definitive leap to faith um, to um, uh, to to assert that. Um, but and then the later existential philosophers kind of were so attracted to Kierkegaard because of his work in the like understanding sort of the aesthetic and the ethical realms, and they kind of secularized Kierkegaard um, and focused on you know the the personal, passionate, subjective experience on the one hand, um, but also you know the ethical um, engagement with others. Okay. Now speaking of faith, there's a phrase called bad faith associated with Sartre, I, I guess. And that may be related to uh, the question of authenticity, um, which looms large, I guess, in existentialism. I didn't realize how large until I glanced at the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. According to their article um, on existentialism, um, I mean, they make it sound like authenticity is almost like a metaphysical category. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's like, uh, let me read you the sentence. So, says existentialism does not deny the validity of the basic categories of physics, biology, psychology, and other sciences, uh, and and or and it doesn't reject moral theory uh, per se. But uh, there is this; um, it, it almost elevates authenticity to the level of of, of those kinds of uh, things. Here's the. Since existentialism, therefore, may be defined as the philosophical theory which holds that a further set of categories, in addition to those categories, governed by the norm of authenticity, um, is necessary to grasp human existence. So do you want to say a little about what they mean by authenticity and maybe relate that to this notion of bad faith, if it's relatable? Yeah. Um, So, well, bad faith is... um, Basically denying your, that you have choices, you know, denying your freedom. Um, and so authenticity, I, I, I guess, I mean, in existentialism, there aren't any like official virtues or anything, but if there were, I mean, authenticity would certainly be one that comes close. And you're authentic when you actively take charge of your life and, um, and choose to do what you think is genuine and right. Um, and it's not always easy to know what's genuine and right, which is why um, Simone de Beauvoir wrote about ambiguity in one of her main books is The Ethics of Ambiguity. Um, so, I, I mean, the idea is that, you know, we should be striving for authenticity. It's not a goal that we can, you know, um, achieve um, because existential philosophy is a philosophy of action and doing. So it's always, you know, about acting mm-hmm. authentically. Um, and... Um, I guess authentic choices are ones that um, open up our future, and um, and that's why Beauvoir was very concerned with um, uh, uh, women um, not being 
um, the second sex anymore because um, their oppression means that their choices are limited and their futures are limited. Um, and so she said that, you know, in order for women to be authentic too, they need to be able to choose from a range of options in an open future. And so bad faith is when you deny that you have those choices and, and say, oh, well, you know, I... I guess, um, and you attribute it to biology, like, oh, I, I have no free will, therefore I was pre-programmed to do it. Like, that kind of um, thinking is bad faith. And, uh, yeah, I assume, that, a- uh, uh, can I just drill down a little bit? I, I assume yeah. that uh, also included in bad faith would just be the, the uh, relatedly, the acceptance, not just of biology, but of social convention as some kind of valid constraint, right? I mean, there is a spirit of nonconformity in existentialism for that reason, I gather. I mean, of course, it's possible that you can decide that your authentic self happens to be uh, exactly the same as the set of roles that society has assigned you from birth. That could happen. But but I, I gather that in existentialism, you're supposed to not assume it's the case, uh, kind of let go of, of socially defined, uh, your, your socially defined self as you explore all possible selves and then pursue whatever the quote authentic self is, regardless of what society is has mapped out for you. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's one of the questions I dealt with. It was that, um, you know, the, I guess my my path was kind of I saw it as being railroaded a little bit into you know certainly you know getting married and things like that. And um, yeah, that and just to do that and say, oh well. You know, we, we should get married just because that's what everyone does or that's the socially acceptable thing. Um, yeah, that would be bad faith. But actually, and, and I mean, it, it does come up as a big question. It's like, well, what if you choose anyway? I mean, I think it's going to be hard to know. I mean, I got married. Um, so I think it's going to be hard to know, like, whether I did that, um, because of some kind of, you know, very ingrained idea I had about what what I should do but I still think going through that exercise of challenging what people expect of you is really important yeah um and Massimo you were going to say something that that is yet another um uh you know kind of area of deep agreement between stoicism and existentialism um although the stoics of course would put it differently but there is a famous passage in epictetus discourses uh where he's talking to his students and he's saying essentially that they have to make choices in life in life and choices are up to us uh, that's one of the things you know decided to do or not to do something or try to do or not to do something is in fact up to you nobody can really um uh, make the choice for you and um, he's talking about integrity. So instead of, of sort of the, the, the existential uh, way of describing things, he's, he's talking about sort of character integrity. It's like you, you need to make choices uh, that are true to your to yourself, to whatever it is that you want to do, and you, whatever it is that you think it's a good way uh, to do things. And at some point he concludes that bit in the discourse and he says, look, um, you know, by all means, uh, at some point you might have to sell your, 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 your integrity, your soul, but at least sell it at the highest possible bid, bidder. In other words, right? So yeah, this so, is where Sky's background in financial markets uh, merges right. with stoicism, that's right. I guess. But so I, I take it that Epictetus is talking, in a sense, about what the existentialists mean by uh, authenticity, right? So if you want to, you, your choices have to be yours. By all means, do get married if that is what you think is a good thing for you, but not as a reflexive, you know, sort of automatic thing. Oh, well, everybody does it. So I suppose this is also my turn, but rather as, wait a minute, let me stop and think about this stuff. And, you know, I may still decide that mm-hmm. certain uh, choices that society expects from me are in fact, okay, I'm okay with those. I'm, I'm going to be happy with those, but those are going to be my choices in the sense that I, I paused and reflected uh, before actually making them, I didn't mm-hmm. do, it, do it automatically. In a sense, so the stories is kind of the opposite of the Nike commercial. Don't just do it. Just stop and think about it. And then you may or may not want to do it. It's, hmm. it, it depends. Well, that's an interesting question. So, Sky, would the existentialist just do it? <laughs> no, no. They would stop. They would stop and think too. Although by stereotype, we imagine it, them just doing it, right? Um, but they yeah. would reflect. No, I think, yeah, absolutely, it's reflection. I mean, I think, so for example, Kierkegaard would get to the stage where you do, you do reflect and then at some point you gotta stop and take a leap. So, because otherwise if you're infinitely reflecting, then you're not gonna be 
you know, not going to be do- actually doing anything. So, yeah, mm. there is at some point where you do have to stop and do it. Um, but sometimes I think the existential philosophers, I think, emphasize that sometimes you, know, you don't know what the right answer is or you don't know until you actually do it. And then it's like so reflecting while doing is also important. Mm-hmm. So, Massimo, you were seeing a real commonality there between uh, Stoicism and existentialism in, in the importance of, uh, you know, not taking for granted uh, socially defined constraints. Yeah. Uh, that, in a way, defies stereotype a little. I would have expected, because we think of the Stoics as saying, okay, here's your situation, deal with it. Right. You know, I would think that your situation includes your your social position. I mean, th- that is... If that's not true, I assume that's a stereotype you have to fight. And, and relatedly, the idea that there's a kind of quietism in stoicism, you know, you know just kind of right. passive acceptance of the of the social order. Are you here to say that that's all wrong or just that it's overstated? Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely all wrong. I mean, as like every stereotype, there is a grain of truth, right? So it is it is certainly the case that endurance is a stoic value. If you can't change things, then your only choice is either to endure them or to just complain the hell out of them. And the Stoics say that complaining the hell out of of things that you cannot change is not not only not helpful because you can't change them, um, it's actually going to make things worse because then you're going to feel, you know, you're going to add self-inflicted, you know, injury to the, to the one that already exists. So there is this, uh, the stereotype is based on a fundamental notion that it is the fact that, that Stoics are into endurance. At the same time, however, um, they kind of strike a balance between those two positions that um, Sky earlier associated with Sartre and the, the why in terms of, you know, um, Sartre was on the, on, more on the, on the side of sort of radical freedom while the Bois uh, 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 sort of accepted the fact that, wait a minute, but there are societal constraints here. There are certain things, you know, if I'm a woman, I'm under certain kinds of constraints. My radical freedom is limited um, by society in a way that it isn't for, for, for men. The Stoics kind of strike a balance between the two. So the, no, the fundamental notion is ultimately the only things you control are your own judgments and, and deci- decisions to act or not to act. That's okay. it. You know, the, you don't control the outcomes. But that doesn't mean you cannot influence outcomes. There's a distinction between controlling and, and influencing, right? So the stoic uh, equanimity comes into the fact that whenever you're trying to do something, uh, you accept from the get-go that you may or may not succeed, and you're going to tell yourself, I'm going to be okay even if I fail. Okay. Right? But that doesn't mean you're not going to try. And, and in fact, there is a lot of um, uh, interesting episodes in the actual lives of, of actual ancient Stoics. As I said earlier, um, Stoicism, like existentialism, is focused on the lives of these people, actually what, what they were actually doing and not just what they were saying. Uh, there is a group of philosophers that um, is mentioned in uh, philosophers and Roman senators mentioned in Epictetus' discourses and about about uh, which we also have independent sources that is kind of collectively referred to as the Stoic opposition. The Stoic opposition was a number of people who openly opposed uh, three emperors, Nero, Vespasian, and Domitian, uh, because they considered those emperors to be tyrants and to limit uh, people's freedoms, such as they, they were understood, of course, in, in ancient Rome, right? And these people actually openly uh, objected to the emperor, and some of them lost their lives as lives as, as a result. Some of them were sent into exile, including Epictetus himself. Epictetus was thrown out of Rome by Domitian, and he had to move to uh, Nicopolis in northwestern Greece, where he established, re-established his, his school. So these were people who understood that at that particular historical moment, there was something really wrong with the Roman system, with the imperial, with the Roman imperial system. Those the, the people that were running the state were corrupt. They were tyrants. They were therefore to be opposed. So that is a case where you are trying to change things on a big scale. You're not trying, this is not a, you know, in fact, it, challenging the emperor in ancient Rome is a, as large a scale as it possibly can get in terms of, of challenging the system. Um, but they were doing that again with the knowledge that I'm trying to do this because this is my own decision. My integ- I'm selling my integrity pretty high uh, mm-hmm. by risking my own life uh, about you know sp- by by speaking up. But I also understand that I don't control the outcome. You know, N- Nero may or may not survive uh, my efforts. Uh, uh, and in fact, he did survive the first round of efforts. Eventually, he did not survive the second one. Um, so, so it is certainly not the case that Stoics don't uh, are not into are not sensitive to the fact that there are some, some situations you need to change. Another big example, again, in terms of 
uh, even more in terms of his life rather than his philosophy because he didn't write much and we don't know much about his philosophy other than he was a Stoic, was Cato the Younger. Cato was uh, an arch enemy of Julius Caesar. He saw Caesar as a tyrant. Correctly, he understood that if Caesar had won the day, that would have been the end of the Roman Republic, which is, in fact, what happened. And he took up arms uh, against Caesar, right? I mean, he, he, st- he literally started a revolution uh, in order to... Uh, uh, um, put a, an obstacle to what he saw, uh, uh, kind of political systemic change that was going in the wrong, in the wrong direction. And he lost his life as, as a result of it. So these are people who uh, fight the, what they, for what they think is, is, is right, even at the cost of their own lives and even in, at the large scale of, you know, starting revolutions and changing systems. Okay. So I want to uh, spend a little time before we go talking about the book more broadly, and that will mean uh, venturing beyond uh, existentialism and stoicism. But first, Sky, I'd like to ask you to talk a little more about authenticity. I mean, um, how do we decide? I mean, let's take me as a test case. I would love to live a more authentic life, and I'm always up for a, a major life change. And I'm starting to really see the appeal of existentialism. You may have a convert here, but uh, how how do I decide? what's authentic is it like a feeling is it an uh, uh, you know i don't i don't really know where to start like i don't know if i should like look to my cultural background and say well stay authentic to what you know you inherited for your parents because that seems kind of arbitrary right uh mm-hmm. like so how do i i i, I seek your guidance Okay. Well, I guess in looking to your cultural heritage, yeah, that's um, one aspect. But also if you stick too rigidly to it, then that's going to turn into bad faith because it's doing just what you were brought up with. Um, one way that um, – okay, uh, can I do this by an example? I guess uh, – yeah, okay. Absolutely. Um, so – I mean, one of the ways I think about is um, Beauvoir's understanding of authentic love, which is a mutual recognition of two liberties. So, I mean, one of the key things I found useful about existential philosophy was um, thinking about how to relate to other people. Um, and so authentic relationships are based on um, respecting and acknowledging each other's freedom and, like, not being possessive and jealous and, and dominating and um, you know, supporting the other person in, you know, their, their hopes and dreams and also you know, figuring out goals together. Um, and so authentic love in by that definition is, you know, not just – it's inspiring us to be better people. So from that, I would say, you know, in terms of authenticity, you know, what is it that – seems to be right and true for you. Um, so, and this is the problem with existential philosophy because there is no quick fix. There is no, you know, um, uh, algorithm that's going to tell you, okay, well, you need to take into account, you know, your background, you know, who your friends are, that sort of thing. Although, you know, because we live in webs of relationships, all these factors are going to influence our decision. Um, and so, and this is why Kierkegaard called it, you know, the, the dizziness of freedom because we are free to, to choose how to live our lives. But, you know, that's very, um, uh, well, dizzying, but also very anxiety inducing. So I guess what I'm saying is that there's no hard and fast answer, but what's important is, is to reflect on what your goals are in life and how you relate to other people in achieving those goals. And existentialism can be a little bit, um, I have a bad reputation for being very individualistic, but I think that's misplaced because um, they say we're, we're thrown into webs of relationships and, you know, we're responsible certainly for ourselves, but we're also responsible for other people by virtue of them being there and being in relationship with them. So, yeah, so thinking about your goals, but also um, in the context of being in relationship with other people. Okay. So for you, uh, the authentic you turned out to be a philosopher. Was that the way, was that the decision you made? Yeah, at the moment. And, and it's, I, I think it's all quite tentative, but yes, um, I guess I was so consumed with these types of questions that, yeah, I, I gave up finance and uh, turned to philosophy. Um, yeah. And so, but I, I think that's also part of the you know, the existential um, idea is that, you know, we're always growing and becoming. So even though I'm a philosopher now, um, doesn't mean that I might not change, you know, my career, you know, in the future. 
Um, but it's always, you know, what's important is to make sure I have that open future in order to be able to change if I can or if I want to. Okay. Um, now let me, let me ask you both to venture beyond your, your kind of favorite philosophies. I mentioned uh, early in the conversation the various, uh, the various traditions that are covered in the book. Let me ask you each to choose one, uh, that you kind of like, that you, that you find appealing and, and you, and you'd like to say something, um, favorable, but maybe it's even a rival. Maybe if you were, uh, Sky, if you were deprived of existentialism, uh, Massimo, if Stoicism wasn't available, maybe it's the one you'd choose uh, as an alternative. But in any event, um, why don't you uh, both uh, take the opportunity to talk about uh, chapters other than the ones you wrote in the book? Okay. Uh, shall I go first? Sure. Um, so, I mean, I think what I loved about editing this book was that there are so many different options or so many different philosophies of life. So I think I got, you know, a, an incredible appreciation for the, for the sheer numbers of, of how people are, are trying to live and trying to live amongst other people. Um, and so I, I would say like there are lots of, um, the philosophies that kind of appeal to me in various ways, but, um, I think the one I found most intriguing, or one of the ones that I found most intriguing and that I admire is the effective altruism chapter, mm. um, which is you know, based on utilitarianism. And um, maybe, the other- maybe you should just pause and say that it is, of course, utilitarianism is the idea to try to maximize overall human welfare or happiness or something. Uh, and then effective altruism is this attempt to really, I guess, spearheaded by Peter Singer, among others, really measure like if you're deciding how to what what charity to donate to or whatever or, or even just how you're going to spend your life to almost quantify what utilitarian value would come from pursuing this path as opposed to that path okay so that's my interjection sorry go ahead yeah and i mean and further to that i mean one of the difficulties is quantifying it um you know what is going to m- um, create the most good and that is you know that's really a really hard question um but i like the emphasis on thinking about the consequences of our actions and um encouraging people to use i guess whatever like resources they have to do the most good um and kelsey piper who wrote the chapter um you know she um, became a journalist who writes about um uh, you know, issues in the world that she wants to fix and, um, she, uh, donates to charity and she gets up at, I don't know, some crazy hour once, once a year when Facebook matches, um, donations. So, um, but I, I mean, I, I'm not a utilitarian in any respect, but I really admire the way that, you know, they're thinking about, um, you know, Kelsey Piper, how she is joining in communities, um, you know, to try and live in ways that minimize harm and, and costs to the world we live in. Okay. Massimo? <laughs> my, my choice is going to be Buddhism, um, which right. is, you, you know something about it. In fact, you know a hell of a lot more than I do about it. And in fact, originally, uh, we asked you to write that chapter, uh, but you were busy working on your book. <laughs> and so we, we turned to Owen Flanagan uh, to, to do the job. Um, but before I, I tell you why Buddhism um, would be a good substitute for me or a good alternative uh, to, to Stoicism, let me step up, step, step um uh, outside for a second of the, and take a look at the bigger picture. The reason we have there a uh, number of philosophies of life and religions, right, as well as things that c- could qualify either way, such as Buddhism, um, is because we define in the introduction uh, a philosophy of life, a life philosophy, as uh, being made of at least two components, sometimes with a third one. The two fundamental components are a metaphysics and an ethics. A metaphysics is a, a, an account of how the world hangs together, so to speak, right? So every religion or philosophy, whether it is existentialist, stoicism, Christianity, Buddhism, and so on and so forth, has some kind of story about how best to conceive uh, the world in which we live. And then the second component is that the ethics, which is, well, given that understanding of how the world works, uh, how are we supposed to behave in the world? What are you going to do about it, right? Um, the third component that some traditions have, but not all, is a set of practices, 
I mean, um, uh, Sky was saying that existentialism doesn't really come with a set of practices, but both Buddhism and Stoicism do, and in fact, all religions do, because if you're talking about reflecting on sacred texts or, or praying or meditating or anything, those are all practices, right, of some sort. Um, so that is what, what uh, those are the three threads or two, two to three threads, depending, uh, they kind of unify the, the whole, the whole bunch. So Buddhism. Now, Buddhist metaphysics, of course, they're different, as you know, uh, far better than I do. There are very different, uh, uh, understandings of Buddhism. So what should talk really about Buddhism's plural? Um, because, and the reason for that is because, of course, it's a tradition, it's an uninterrupted tradition that's been going on for two and a half millennia, which means it has spun out a bunch of different uh, schools and subschools, some of which are more markedly religious, some of which are essentially secular or skeptical. Uh, this has not happened with Stoicism because Stoicism got interrupted by the rise of Christianity, right? It went on for about 500 years, uh, and then the rise of Christianity basically uh, meant the end of all the Hellenistic uh, philosophy schools. Uh, so Stoicism kept influencing people, including Christians, uh, you know, some, some of the major Christian authors, and then all the way into modern uh, philosophy. But as a tradition, it only reemerged very, very recently in the last in the last few decades. So Stoicism, in a sense, is far more uh, uh, sort of uh, less, less heterogeneous. There, there are differences, as I mentioned earlier, among Stoics themselves, but it's far less heterogeneous than, Bo- than Buddhism. So, however, if we take, let's say, what it's hopeful, uh, probably a majority of traditions in Buddhism, I actually don't feel particularly uh, comfortable with the metaphysics aspect of it. So I don't believe in you know reincarnation, karma, and all that sort of stuff. Although I understand that there are Psycho Buddhists who also don't, you know, who also reject those. those right. I, th- I think with Buddhism, more than some traditions, it, it's actually possible to separate a philosophical component from a religious, so to speak, um, component. Yeah. And, and I've always kind of focused on the philosophical in, right. um, in advocating right. it. So, but in terms of the ethics, there is a lot of stuff in Buddhism that goes very well with the teachings of Stoicism or, or vice versa. Um, and, you know, for instance, you know, the, the notions of non-attach, non-attachment is, mm-hmm. is, is something that you also, also find in Buddhism, in Stoicism with a slightly different emphasis. And again, coming from a different metaphysical background. Um, Buddhists are often, uh, you know, there's often a reference to this, this notion of no self, which my understanding, at least by reading both your stuff and, uh, and Owen's stuff, is that a lot of Westerners have this uh, uh, misconception that no self means that there is no metaphysical self. The, the, while no self actually means that you should be less attached to your own stuff and care less about about you and, and more about others, because after all, one of the major goals, if not the major goal of Buddhism, is to decrease suffering in the world. That, and so, if, I, I would just say quickly that's the ethical yeah. implication of not self or the ethical dimension. There is a, a metaphysical version of it that, in some renderings, are. Uh, more extreme than the average, uh, sure. right. Western philosophy. Now, the, the Stoic that, equivalent but... is, you know, the Stoics, uh, accepted Heraclitus metaphysics. Heraclitus was a, a pre-Socratic philosopher, the, the, the one that famously said that you never step in the same river twice. Well, why not? Because the river itself, and in fact, you are not fixed objects. You don't have an essence. You are dynamic processes, right? You change all the time. And so even for the Stoics, the self is not an essence. It's a dynamic process. But nevertheless, there is such a, you know, there is me. I am, I am now talking to you, uh, whatever you want to, however you want to understand I, and I am the one that is responsible for my own decisions, not, not you, even though, of course, my own self will change and has changed. I'm not the person I was five years ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago, and presumably I'm not the person that I will be in five years or, or 10 years down the road. Um, but there are other, many other points of context in terms of the ethics. I mean, the, the, the notion of, of um, being mindful, for instance, of you know, right reason, right intention, all of those concepts found, uh, find the equivalent in Stoicism in terms of the practice of the four virtues, which are, you know, practical wisdom, courage, justice, and temperance. The language is different. The way they are presented is different. But the fundamental concept, I think, are actually very similar. In fact, they are so similar that, as I mentioned earlier, uh, during my period of exploration of a number of philosophies, Buddhism was on my list. I, I did read um, you know, a, a number of, of things in that area because it, it intrigued me. It was something that was actually speaking to me. Okay. Sky, let me just quickly ask you, uh, just take off on that, because because Massimo brought up the word kind of essence. Um, now, I know, I mean, essence is a, I mean, Buddhist, Buddhism is very anti-essentialism. That's certainly true. And that's part of, of what is meant by the not-self idea. There's a sense in which there is no 
essence of me. Um, essence, as you mentioned, that essence enters um, existentialism in the formulation, existence precedes essence. Um, is it wrong for me to think that in trying to find um, my authentic path by existential lights, I am some sense trying to figure out what is the essential me, like what is essence of Bob? Is that wrong? Yeah, well, I think the existential view is that there isn't an essence that's already there that you're trying to discover. It's an essence that you're creating by you know, pursuing your projects, by doing things, um, by living, projecting yourself into the future. So it's something, so I guess the... So you the choose notion- the essence you want to construct rather than trying to align your life with what just is self-evidently your essence. Right. Okay, I guess I'm up for that. It might be easier if somebody could just tell me what the essence of me is, but I guess uh, if I have to construct it, I guess I'm I'm willing to try. So let me, uh, I, I have a kind of a closing question. Before I ask it, Sky, I want to ask you about your time constraints. Are you, are you okay for a little longer? You were the one who yeah, said. Yeah, I have a yeah. few more minutes. Yeah. Okay. So quickly, let me just say uh, enough that it will allow you both to basically say anything you want to say in closing, but it, it has to do partly with the connection between philosophies and religions. You have both philosophical traditions and religious traditions. Buddhism, you've got under philosophy because uh, Owen Flanagan is more interested in the kind of philosophical, naturalistic, you might say, part of Buddhism. Um, uh, But, you know, Hinduism, you've got uh, under religion. Um, There's one other little uh, kind of quirk here, which is that under religious traditions, you've got Hinduism, Judaism, Christianity, progressive Islam. See, it's not just Islam, it's progressive Islam. And a couple of things, I mean, first I can imagine someone objecting, like, wait a second, is the assumption that Islam per se uh, is is not progressive, whereas these other things inherently are? And of course, that's not true. I mean, there, there, there are a variety of kinds of Christians and Hindus and so on. And in a way, my well, it's not a question I'm demanding that you both answer or anything, but it's a, it's an issue I want to raise. It, it's a, it gets back to essentialism in a way, essence. Like, it seems to me that certain philosophies, at least, it's fairly easy to characterize as having, in some sense, an essence. I mean, Massimo, you said partly uh, because Stoicism didn't have a lot of time to diverge and branch out and evolve, uh, and, and it and it developed initially in a kind of a local area. It's a reasonably coherent uh, set of principles. Whereas all of these religions, you know, you can you can find adherents who take them in radically different ethical and, for that matter, metaphysical uh, uh, directions. So I guess again, there's no one question you have to answer. I mainly want to give you both a chance to say whatever you want to say. But I guess the the backdrop is. This whole question of, uh, well, there's, there's, there's a decision to put religious traditions as well as philosophical. The question of whether with religious traditions, it's, it's even harder to describe an, an essence or a single tradition than it is with many philosophical, uh, traditions. And I guess more broadly, the fact that, uh, Many people choose one or the other. They, they say, you know, I'm a religious person. That's my source of guidance or I'm not religious. Uh, and then they may be lucky enough to have a philosophical tradition that they can really put stock in and uh, and use. That, so you can say almost anything in response to that and <laughs> you can do it in any order. Um, all right. Well, I just mentioned that I absolutely agree with you that, you know, religions are so incredibly diverse that it's difficult to generalize. And it was difficult for us to kind of narrow down, you know, why, why these few, but we tried to sort of focus on some of the main ones. And the progressive Islam was really um, kind of, we were looking yeah, for the standard ones, but we're also looking for, you know, interesting ones like, um, I mean, ethical culture is much smaller, but it's like a really interesting idea because it's spiritual, but it's also, well, some people consider it a religion, some don't. Um, so, and then, um, you know, the contributor, as when we were talking to him, he's done some um, really great writing on, on Islam and, you know, it just turned out that his particular way of living his philosophy was progressive so i guess in that way it wasn't like an in, in 
so intentional other than just trying to give a really diverse perspective of it, like a few examples. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. I mean, to let me just extent, quickly say ethical culture you did put in a religion. That's interesting because I, I the ethical culture society I almost see as being um, – by self-definition, an alternative religion, but they do the kind of rituals. That's the interesting thing. I mean, they have a service and they, and, and yeah. so on. So yeah, that's a chapter worth reading by uh, Ann Clayson, I think, who's, yeah. uh, who's there at Columbia. Um, that's right. So, but the, the, the question here with, uh, with, um, uh, progressive Islam, for instance, could have e- just as easily uh, a reason with Buddhism if Owen had decided to change the title of the, of the book, uh, sorry, the book of the of this chapter to you know secular Buddhism. Then there would have been a particular tradition, or a particular aspect, or a particular way of presenting Buddhism. In fact, originally we actually asked our authors to to cover the more general version of their philosophies, their chosen philosophies. But some of them said, no, I'm not. I'm not going to do it that way. I'm going to do it the way I actually live it, um, and and that was fine with us. Um, I think that to, to some extent, in answer to your original question about, you know, what is the essence, if any, of these, of these, these traditions, um, I'm going to go Wittgenstein on you. Um, <laughs> meaning, <laughs> Good luck. meaning that, yeah, I know, right? Um, meaning that, that, um, as Wittgenstein, you know, prominent mid 20th century philosopher pointed out, um, language is a game in a sense, meaning that it is, it's a question of agreement among, among a community of language speakers. And so there is no such thing as the essence of any of these terms. Uh, these are cultural traditions, um, both religious or philosophical or sometimes kind of uh, having aspects of both. And if I consider myself a stoic, all of that means really is that uh, my way of thinking has been inspired by a particular uh, tradition uh, that, generally speaking, is labeled as stoic. Uh, the same goes for for you know, the, the Christians, for instance. I mean, the other tradition I'm familiar with is Christianity because I grew up Catholic. I mean, there are some Christians who are actually secular. They believe that Jesus was like a Socrates uh, 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 figure, not uh, not you know, the son of God. Mm-hmm. So that's pretty radical in terms of sort of, um, you know, di- uh, differentiating yourself from, from a very long and, ver- and well-established tradition. And even within Christianity, as we know, there is a number of different ways of interpreting and putting emphasis on one thing rather than the other. What brings them all together is the fact that they, that all member, all people who think of themselves as Christian sort of refer to a certain cultural tradition. Often I'm asked, you know, I, I'm, I've been involved in this project of uh, sort of trying to update Stoicism, particularly aspects of Stoic ethics and, and especially Stoic metaphysics to the 21st century. And the, often the question is, that I get asked is, well, but is that still Stoicism? And my answer is, frankly, well, if I say it is, it is. <laughs> Me- meaning that, or, or if enough people say, I should say more correctly, say it is, then it is, right? You don't, you don't pick your own language, but, but if you have enough people that say, yeah, that's close mm-hmm. enough. That's, that's, uh, uh, I can see why you would, you would go that way, uh, then it is a fact. And if enough people are going to say, no, actually, you know what, Massimo, what you're doing doesn't, it's not recognizable as does, and then, then I guess it will become something else, uh, or, or nothing at all, depending on whether people pay attention to it or not. So I think we should be, we shouldn't be overly concerned with, uh, you know, but is it really Buddhism or is it really Hinduism or something like that? Um, uh, there's really no reason, no, 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 no particular pay, payoff in, in being, trying to be, uh, sort of purists about, about this sort of stuff. Um, another aspect of the same question is, uh, well, what about eclecticism? So there are some people, like, for instance, our missing co-editor, uh, you know, uh, uh, Dan, Kaufman. Dan Kaufman, he's, he's often uh, sort of comes across as a little bit of eclectic. I mean, he, he, he wrote the, the, the chapter on, Arist- on neo-Aristotelianism, but it's like, you know, it, it, bits and pieces of things. Uh, he's open at, at sort of different uh, different influences. And some people re- reject that. Uh, and they say, well, but, but if you start picking pieces right and left, then you're going to end up with an incoherent jumble. And I think that is a reasonable concern. If, if you do it sort of in a mindless way. But we also have to remember that pretty much all of these traditions themselves were influenced by other traditions, both before and during. The Stoics came out of Socratic uh, philosophy, and they were highly influenced by the, the Cynics. 
And part of their philosophical understanding changed as a, re- as a reaction over time, as a reaction fr- uh, of criticism from the outside, from the Epicureans and the academic skeptics. Um, so all of these are, in fact, eclectic in some sense, but you want to be eclectic in a way that makes sense, in a way that is, you know, sufficiently coherent. So, because after all, what is it that we're talking about here? You, you earlier were asking, uh, sky for specifically, like, you know, so what, how, how can I behave in an authentic way or something like that, right? Uh, but remember that most of these traditions, in fact, I would argue actually all of them, even the, even the, the deontological ones, the ones based on sort of commandments kind of stuff and, and rigid rules. Um, they're really not supposed to tell you what to do on a moment by moment basis. They are a framework, right? They are, they are a general compass that kind of orient yourself, uh, in, in your life. And so if I am, if I follow the stoic compass, uh, it turns out that, that um, you know, for most of the, the, the things that I do during, during my day, I ask myself, well, is this wise, is this courageous, is this just, and it is, is, it, is this temperate? Those are just helpful uh, ways of, of, of organizing my thoughts. Uh, the answer to the, to the question in the specific, is this particular action going to be temperate, just, and so on and so forth? That, that's up to me. Nobody else is going to say, you know, nobody's going to excommunicate me from, from stoic, uh, uh, church for giving the wrong answer. In fact, in a sense, that's, that's why they're called personal philosophies. They're, they give you a general framework, a, a way to navigate your life in a more coherent, uh, and useful fashion. But after, but, but at the end of the day, the, the, you know, it, it's up to you at, at, uh, at what price you sell your integrity, as Epictetus put it. Yeah, and okay. I think one of the goals of the book is that it's um, it's more like an opening or a gateway for people to kind of get a taster and understand different philosophies and to reflect on their own philosophy of life or religion, um, but also, you know, like I said, have an appreciation for other philosophies of life and hopefully to enter into a conversation about, um, you know, a, about other perspectives and, you know, because I think the world could do with a whole lot more understanding right now. Yeah, I think you're, uh, yeah, it's like, uh, you know, Whitman's chocolates used to have this thing called a Whitman sampler, and it would have like one thing of all these different kinds of chocolates. This is like a philosophical sampler. It's a good, <laughs> you've got commendably short chapters on uh, all of these uh, different traditions written by people who, who in some sense believe in them. Uh, and, um, and so it's, it's a, a great smorgasbord. Uh, to switch culinary metaphors a little bit. And I'm glad you mentioned Dan, the missing uh, co-editor, Dan Kaufman, who wrote the chapter on Aristotelianism. Maybe maybe Dan can can uh, later uh, at some point come on and just defend Aristotelianism because that is something that, like existentialism, uh, I started out uh, knowing very little about. And, Sky, thanks for um, bringing me closer to my authentic self. Uh, in the, in the course of this, congratulations to both of you on the book. Uh, this is this is what it looks like. Holding it up to the camera, very recently published uh, by Vintage Books. How to Live a Good Life: A Guide to Choosing Your Personal Philosophy. Uh, congratulations and good luck with it. Thank Thanks, you. Bob.